Hey everybody, Bobby Medina here with my good friend and dear pal, Paul Barron. And we are back with uh, the Wunderkind here, Michael Kim, <laughs> who you remember from uh, probably his last release. And if you, if you didn't see that, uh, be sure to check it out. Um, but Michael is a tremendous uh, up and coming young player and he releases uh, some wonderful videos of uh, great music and not only is it just great music but the videos are really fun in themselves so we wanted to talk a little bit about his upcoming release so welcome Michael how you doing thanks Bobby it's nice to be back hey Michael so um I know that uh that this is quite an interesting and huge undertaking for this next project uh, coming up and uh, so I wanted to ask you, um, I've known of this tune and played it um, for, for years, uh, Artistry and Rhythm uh, That's from right. Canton. Uh, and this is a new twist on that, Artistry in Metal, uh, for anybody that's into guitars and, and uh, screaming high trumpet stuff, this is the <laughs> perfect recording for that. So yeah. I'm curious, what was your inspiration in this uh, developing Stan Canton's Artistry and Rhythm to utter Artistry and Metal? It has largely to do with uh, my mentor, uh, Fred Stride. He's a world-class composer, arranger. Uh, I've known him for about 10 years now, been um, pretty much, I can say, studying with him as a band leader. I run a band with him called Vancouver Legacy Jazz Orchestra. So he already knew that I was doing online projects that feature high trumpets and stuff. Um, he actually had a metal version of artistry and rhythm already written out for his daughter that never got to be played and he just showed me just threw in some solo trumpet kind of a track on top of it and asked me if i like it and i just listened to it and as with most things that fred Wright, i just loved it just fell in love at the first sight so i just wrote him back and said, please go ahead. And he asked me to give him a month and a bit. And now we're working on it. I did not realize he would write such ridiculous trumpet lines. I had to sit down and turn a metronome on and go up by 1 BPM. So that's, that's the practice routine for this. Well, uh, for those out there watching, both Bobby and I were involved in this too. And I, I can uh, speak for myself that I had to go through the same process. It was ridiculously <laughs> tough under the fingers. Bobby, what about you? It, it was a knuckle buster. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> to put it. You know, and uh, playing the, these tricky patterns and tricky, uh, tricky fingerings and at a, at a ridiculous pace. I think, honestly, for me, I, I have to say, I think this is amongst the fastest written lines that I've ever had to play in my life. Me yes. too. Same. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I think they, they, uh, just when you thought they would be chromatic and you could sail through them, <laughs> there was one note changed. Yeah, that's right. Going it's up, like a key change, a different one changed coming down. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Well, Fred. I, I think <laughs> the, you, the effect uh, will be really, really nice, and your playing is just stellar on this, Michael. It's just thanks, uh, Bobby. Just super, super exciting. So tell us a little bit about the launch. How many and how many people were involved in it? So let's see, we have four French horns. We kind of cheated on the fourth French horn. Uh, we decided to go with a euphonium to fatten up the sound. It's just a little bit of a different sound. And I mean, we could have got another French horn, but I thought it would be nice to add some euphonium to mm -hmm. the French horn section. A EQ little more it a depth, bit. maybe. That's yeah. right. More depth and just more body to the sound. You just had him put his hand in the bell and miss a bunch of notes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think you can see that in the video. When the... <laughs> he actually does that. And tuba, we had uh, we got tuba in there. We got a full trombone section, four trombones. We got four beautiful trumpet sections I had the privilege to work with. It's Paul, Bobby, and we had Dave Dunlop, who um, played lead trumpet in uh, Boss Brass after Arnie Tchaikovsky. And we had uh, Ron DeLauro as well. And he's with um, University of Montreal, uh, used to be with um, McGill University. 
as a prof there. And yeah, I just didn't have to worry about the trumpet section. Just send out the parts and just, you know, have the masters deal with it. And I got the parts and let us pray and, and bleed and sweat and then send it back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the trumpet section was great. Um, actually, that was the only way that would have worked if I didn't get heavy weights to play that it just won't work it's the trumpet parts were just too hard and we got um a rhythm section so we got a full rhythm section we got two guitar parts actually played by one person uh daryl shanky and he is our local um uh study actually no he doesn't study there can you edit this out <laughs> yeah he um plays at um all over he teaches at vcc vancouver community college and we got um i think that's about it and we got our special saxophone player that has always been into the video but i just decided to make him a, a special guest and just solo over top of the band that way you wouldn't run into the same problem that uh, rob mcconnell did way way back when he was starting boss brass there were no reeds at all. It was strictly trombones, trumpets, and rhythm section. And uh, <laughs> apparently, as the story goes, a bunch of saxophone players came into the club where they were performing, and and they're like, you know, <laughs> like this. You guys need saxophones. This is a big band. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Michael, I'd like to ask you about how you developed your high range, because boy, you just you soar for days, and it's just beautiful and and seemingly uh, effortless. So, um, you know, I, first of all, <laughs> darn, you know, for having chops <laughs> like that. But second of all, t tell us how you developed those chops. Absolutely. Uh, as far as I can remember, um, I started playing trumpet around grade nine. That was, uh, can't, I can't remember how many years ago that was. Um, I just picked up a trumpet and just started playing around with it. I had a decent E flats above high C. High range was always um, easier for me than the low range. Uh, unlike most people, I, I have to work downwards. If I'm warming up, I have to warm up downwards because as soon as I pick up the horn, I'm not gonna be able to play a good low G or anything like that uh, below the staff or even like a low C. Sometimes I struggle with that. So I have to warm up, well, warm down in my case. And so where do you start when you're starting? What are your first notes of the day? That's that I've never heard of anybody doing this, but this is super curious. I'm super curious about it. Yeah, usually I just try to start at just a nice low G um, in the staff just a nice G in the staff or C just to check my tuning. And I just do a couple octave slurs and that's pretty much my warm up because um, as soon as the slurs start working, my low range is no problem. So I just need to so make sure- So you're slurring slur like works. from middle C up to high C and down, something like that? Yeah, that's right. Or um, I like to use the concert pitches. So I, I like to do a trumpet D I go D and I okay. check it. I check the D above. I go up to um, an A or a double D and then come back all the way down to a F sharp. And once that works, then I think it's good to go. And range was um, always been not one of the things I had to work on. I, I did when I initially started playing trumpet I had an E flat in grade nine, and then I wanted to get it a bit more, um, bit more high. So during the summer between grade nine and grade ten, that's where I kind of cracked um, how to play a G above high C. Just playing around with my chops, just playing around with my tongue position, and that's where I actually, ironically, figured out how to do a shake as well and lip trills just from the tongue um, position. Mm. So that's where I got the G. You know, Paul and I encourage people to experiment, for lack of a better word, 
to figure out what works for them because even Absolutely. though there are systems of playing and ideas about different techniques, you still have to figure out what works. I myself have to kind of, I would say manipulate my chops a little bit if I'm playing some, a mouthpiece that's really shallow as opposed mm -hmm. to playing something that's bigger. It's, a, it's, it's an, they feel like they're in a slightly different position. So when you're talking about how you cracked this, uh, you know, how you discovered your range or whatever mm -hmm. we want to say, what were some of the things you did? Did you remember with your, just like with your, say your lip positions or your jaw positions or? Absolutely. For me, I realized that my jaw position has to be relatively um, just firm, uh, not moving. My jaw can't really move because as soon as it starts moving, going I, I, then it's um, it fattens up the sound, but I just lost the range. Uh, so I did another exercise to counter that so I can have a fat sound up there. But that's in my later years. Uh, what I did mostly to crack that was um, just operate my tongue in a way that kind of worked, that I didn't have to jam the mouthpiece on my face, which really hurt actually. And I thought, wow. We know wow, that feeling well. Yeah, Boy, this, we. this could really hurt me. <laughs> and my band director at the time in high school, Eddie Trovato, I just showed him a sheet music that had, an high, that had a high F. Um, and I asked him, well, what's the fingering for this? How do I play this? And he just looks at me. He's like, don't kill yourself. Don't try it. <laughs> so I didn't get any instruction and I just, uh, just kept playing and I just somehow cracked it during that summer. And I think it's literally just tongue position and fast air stream. That's what I can remember. I didn't really do any exercises per se in terms of cracking that register it's i just feel like were you uh, more me, just like playing notes or playing music like melodies and things up there yes playing music was the key thing because i wanted to incorporate into music rather than just being able to pop it out like once or twice i think it has something to do with uh me being able to shake and literal from then on so my best um, guess on what I think I did back then, because it's so long ago, is um, I just manipulated my tongue and that's how I was able to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's cool. That's very interesting. Well, as far as like, you know, your gear, tell us a little bit about what you're playing on and what you used for this uh, for this recording as well. Absolutely. I play, uh, I play on Yamaha and I've been playing uh, the uh, 8335 LA, which is the Wayne Bergeron model. And I'm sure everybody would know why I would be playing that. Um, it slots really well. It's a very good studio horn. It's not very free blowing, but I kind of like that resistance when it comes to studio, high, high stake environment where I just want to get things done without many mistakes and it it really works for me i don't know if it works for everybody else but it seems to be um, a very good fit for my um the way i use my airstream well it works for wayne and it i think it works for louis dodswell too pretty pretty yes. well so how about your um how about your mouthpiece setup what were you playing when you're i mean what do you what do you use when you're playing these like i mean because we're talking extreme high register things that you're doing this is kind of beyond the <laughs> the normal <laughs> almost you're getting into superhuman territory sometimes which is uh really exciting uh, and so does does your gear vary when you're playing something like that as opposed to maybe doing some other kind of show some kind of Broadway thing or like a salsa band or a big band type of performance? Um, not really. My mouthpiece has always been pretty much the same. Um, embarrassed to say, I haven't really invested much in gear up till about a year ago. And 
I have played around with mount pieces before, but then I figured out that having 10 different mount pieces is not very good for me. It may work for some people, but it just doesn't work for me. I need to be able to really work out how this one particular mount piece works and get comfortable with it. I mean, if I were to go into a classical situation and just sit in on a fourth chair or something like that, I would not be using what I'm using right now, which is a wedge. It's just a 14A, 4A, but a wedge. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to probably change into Bach 3C or something like that. That would be a lot more comfortable for me when it comes to um, low, big, fat sound kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But for salsa bands, Broadway shows, um, even jazz gigs, I, I don't change my mouthpieces. It's pretty much what it is. I have to say, and I know we've had Do Dr. Dave Harrison on here, you know, uh, mm -hmm. with for an interview, and, and, and I have a wedge that I play on um, quite often. And I, I, I know he says it doesn't work, it's not for everybody, but mm -hmm. boy, I, I think if you are the, have the right dental structure, That's facial right. structure, they're pretty cool. I mean, this thing really, really works, works for me. Uh, and it's just interesting. I even have like mine. I'm not sure about you, but my, I have an angled rim on mine. And oh, really? one of the mm. cool things that I find about that particular mouthpiece is that he has the cup, but he has the cup. Like if the mouth, if the, the rim is angled, the cup is moved. So it still has the same oh. volume of the cup, but it's deeper on the bottom and it's shallower from the midsection on up. So when I, for me, when I direct my air down, if I'm playing in the lower register, my mm -hmm. sound, even though it's a relatively sh shallow, I mean, the one I'm playing is a Chuck Finley model. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the lower register, it sounds nice and fat. And yet I got something to push against when I want to play higher. So it's kind of an exciting and an intriguing uh shape and something that he's come across that I think is really unique. And there are people that it, that it really works for. So that's great. Yeah. I've never actually heard of that. The angled rim. Yeah. Mine's yeah. just a straight. Uh... Yeah. No, he can do them at different, at different ones. And I've had bent mouthpieces and I'm kind of a, just, you know, as an aside for all the gear heads and for the trumpet geeks out here, um, you know, I kind of play downwards and, and I, you know, when I'm leading a show or whatever, I, I, I tend to bring my horn up and a lot mm -hmm. of times it can add excess pressure to my upper absolutely lip so i'm always trying to balance it out and i'm always trying to counteract it but mm -hmm. i i do like the aesthetics of playing up up a little bit more and i don't have an extreme uh, you know lower set but it's nice to have this little angle and just by having this angle much like a bent mouthpiece i i just feel like i just mm -hmm. naturally have more weight of the mouthpiece on my bottom on my lower lip and so it seems to help me quite a bit that sounds great. I, I should ask Dr. Dave Harrison if uh, if I can get a mouthpiece like that too. You just should try, try it, it if you yeah. haven't done it. I mean, I know they can, they can do it up to like, I think 10 or 12 degrees. Mine is just five, but it mm -hmm. it's really makes a big difference for me. It's not too much or not too little. So, well, anyway, so Artistry in Metal comes out on, uh, when is it coming out? It's coming out on Wednesday the 26th at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Okay, very cool. So we want to make sure everybody gets on this thing and, and shares and enjoys the premiere uh, with Michael and everybody else in the group. And we'll post up a link for it. And, uh, you know, we'll ha you'll have one more feather in your cap and another <laughs> uh, beautiful example of your playing. So thank you, uh, Michael, for spending a little bit of time with us. Thanks, Bobby. And Thank you, Paul, for being here again. Thank you, Paul. All the way from, uh, you know, from beautiful Las Vegas. Yeah. And remember, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fellas, we'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone.